Shields up, Ironbreakers. Welcome back to another episode of Con's Anvil. How's everybody doing today? Hope you're all doing good. Hope you're all ready for another show. Just a quick heads up, though, if you happen to be a member through the YouTube membership system and all of that stuff, I'm going to be working on a Q&A type of episode where you can ask me a bunch of questions, all that stuff. And I just posted um, a community post over on the community tab. So just in case you remember and you missed out on that, uh, that is something that you can go to. You can put a comment there for like the Q&A. It's kind of like a behind the scenes type of thing. And that is going to be one of the things that I'm going to be doing for uh, members and all that stuff. But yeah, hopefully you guys are excited. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today. Feeling like crap. Oh, damn. Sorry to hear that, Kegrin. Thank you very much for being grossing at this for 67 months. Tip of the hat. Appreciate support. Thank you. Prowler Kings, Zozo, Celeste, Dave Jennings, Lumpy. What's up? Transcivery of Waifu, Mr. Tummy Giggles, Lord Snake. People looking to cry over something? What are we talking about? We're looking forward to Remnant 2 new content. Oh, dude, I'm glad you discovered the game here. I love Remnant 2. Best game came out last year, in my opinion. Recent turmoil with anime localization. Dylan J will... I mean, I guess we can talk about that. Since people apparently are asking about it. Mr. Clean Rur, what's your thoughts on Capcom localization? Okay, yeah, I, I saw the post. I haven't really read all the way through it. I kind of feel like it's all connected to some of the... Uh, recent stuff that's been happening with uh with the gaming industry that to be honest i haven't really spoke about all that much mostly because you know it's one of the situations where sides are being taken and i feel like there's uh there's plenty of bad to be had on both sides of the argument like i, I remember back in the day whenever there was like these big controversial situations i used to think like oh i need to take a side on this i need to take a, a stand on this controversial situation what i've come to learn over the years is that there's usually bad actors on both sides so i no longer really take sides when it comes to that stuff when it comes to capcom localization specifically i haven't really seen egregious examples where capcom localization has uh done a terrible job of localizing their titles I've never noticed something that I was like, oh my God, this was clearly something that was, you know, done for the West or something like that. If I run into one of those situations, then there would be something that I would, you know, uh, that I would entertain. But as of right now, I haven't seen a situation that I would consider to be terribly egregious, so to speak. Need a play Ace Attorney then? Okay. Will we be grabbing no rest for the wiki early access later in the week, Rui? Yep. Didn't vibe with Baldur's Gate 3? What do you mean? I love Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, I mean, there's the video that has a bit of a clickbaity title. Yes, you're right. I did make a video that says I love Baldur's Gate 3 until I didn't. Uh, the reality is I still really enjoyed Baldur's Gate 3, but that act 3 kind of broke me a little bit. And... I'm not the biggest fan of the main story of Baldur's Gate 3. Not to say that's not to say that it's bad. It is to say that it is not my favorite story. Okay, because a lot of people tend to misconstrue that as like, oh, so you didn't like the story, so that's you're trying to say the story is bad. No, I'm trying to say that I didn't like it because it wasn't for me. But most of the other stories, besides the the main plot, I loved. So you know, there's that to it. Chromag, thank you very much, Bingo. Let's get this for 16 months. Tip of the hat. Appreciate support. Thank you. What are the Capcom IPs you'd like them to dig back up? They made recent polls surveying people's opinions. They brought up a lot like Honey Mosha and Mega Man. To be honest, the Capcom IPs that I'm really into are kind of like some of the latest stuff that they've done. Dragon's Dogma, Monster Hunter coming out in 2025. Those are like my big Capcom IPs. So I'm good right now. As Mr. Tommy Giggles is saying, Baldur's Gate 3 shines in its individual character stories more than the main one, for sure. 
Nothing like sitting in a hot tub listening to Rui talk about stuff. Always a great way to start the day. Hey, I I like breaking boundaries. I don't want people just watch me, watching me on their phones or on their PCs. Having people watch me in a hot tub, good stuff. Good stuff indeed. But yeah, lots and lots and lots of stuff happening. So one of the first things that I want to bring up today, let me see, I think this is the right scene. Oh no, it wasn't actually the right scene. No, it, it is, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder why the face cam was hidden there. Oh, because I was uh, capturing footage earlier. <laughs> but anyway, guys, one of the things that I would like to shout out before we proceed with the show, I did get to sit down with the creative director of Enshrouded, uh, this is Anthony from Keen Games. Uh, we got to sit down and talk about Enshrouded in great length. It's a two-hour discussion where we go from everything from business model to, you know, their potential monetization options that they're considering and all of that stuff. Uh, this live stream will automatically redirect you, but in case you want to note this down for something to watch later, it is going to be going live in about four hours and change. By then, this live stream will likely be over. But, you know, this is going to be something that's going to go live on the channel today. And I really hope you guys uh, check it out because, you know, I want to be able to do more of these in the future. And it all starts with you guys watching the stuff that I do when it comes to these. Look at those upscaled wrinkles. Yeah, dude, ever since you uh, you got me on that upscaling uh, on that upscaling software, I'm like, oh, hells yeah. Because I'd rather my face be smooth then be all grainy because the, the the face cam captures usually look really grainy when i put them on thumbnails so yeah i've been upscaling stuff using this software that mr tummy giggles has recommended but yeah big conversation about enshrouded in this podcast later today hope you guys are excited about that now in the near future there's a lot of stuff coming out there's a lot of stuff coming out. This is going to be very hard for me to cover all of these things, okay? Keep that in mind. So I don't know, you know, with the situation with uh, being a parent of two kids and trying to cover like four video games in the span of two weeks, this is going to be damn near impossible. But we are going to be streaming this, No Rest for the Wicked. I've told you guys I'm super excited about this game. I really want to check it out. So this is definitely going to be something that I'm going to be jumping into. This one might end up being on the back burner. I've actually been trying to push through uh, Final Fantasy 16's Final Fantasy mode because, uh, you know, I was already in Final Fantasy mode when the DLC came out, but I was like, I think I might have been at 20% or 30% progression. So I have to push through the rest of the game in order to get to the point where I can do Fall Echoes of Fallen whatever and the Rising Tide. So this one might end up getting pushed back and then maybe I'll just stream it at some point or something. Again, there's too much happening in the gaming industry for me to be able to cover every single thing. But yeah, this one also comes out 18th, which is the same day as No Rest for the Wicked. It's like, bruh, gaming company, please. I mean, gaming industry, please. And then in comes Remnant 2, bam, 23rd of April. We're dropping a new DLC and I'm like, bro, please. We already have Stellar Blade on the 26th. Like, <laughs> please. How am I supposed to play all of these amazing titles at the same time? Which is which is really, I find super interesting that you see so many people posting negative stuff about like, oh, the gaming industry is dying and there's all of these bad things happening. And I was like, bro, I can't even play all the video games I want to play. What do you mean there's the industry's dying? <laughs> I need more hours in the day just to be able to play more video games. Only two kids? What about us? Yeah, I know. I know. Having some high hopes for no rest for the wicked. Yeah, likewise. I'm super curious to see what that's going to be like. You can just adventure mode Remnant 2 DLC and hardcore farm it later. What do you mean? Of, of course. I mean, yeah. Of course we're going to adventure mode the Remnant 2 DLC. But that's, that still doesn't mean that, you know, it's still very little time. K 
can't wait for another Call of Duty streamer to say there's nothing to play again this year. It does feel like that, right? It's always the the people that just want to jump into shooters and stuff like that. They're the ones that are having it rough. Because, like, bro, the rest of us, the rest of us are eating good. We're eating good. And in May, we have St um, Hellblade 2 as well. It's like it's too much. It'll take like three hours adventure mode like the last one. It depends on the difficulty that that you do it on. Because like I remember the, the last one was like five hours for me if I remember correctly. Doesn't it? Like we can actually check. It's called Forgotten King. I think Forgotten... Wait, was it Forgotten King? It wasn't Forgotten King, was it? No, Awakened King. Awakened King. Yeah, see, I had to do two videos. It was actually almost seven hours, but probably the last one. Oh, no. No, never mind. Yeah, it was. took me about seven hours, actually. But then again, I was playing an Apocalypse. I think I might bump it down to Nightmare, because Apocalypse last time was not the most fun. So I might bump it down to Nightmare just to enjoy it. Because we don't have a whole lot of time. Yeah, I soloed it. Did we go straight into co-op last time? Or did we do a... We did it solo first. We could just go into co-op as well. Maybe we'll just go into co-op. That's another thing. Yeah, was it, there was also the balancing issues with the green boys. The green boys in Remnant 2, those guys were rough. Those guys were rough. They weren't playing around. Also need to buy the Remnant 2 DLCs. I cannot recommend Remnant 2 enough. I feel like Remnant 2 is very much uh, an underrated gem. Let me actually see what their Steam charts are like, just out of curiosity. Yeah, bro, this is like giga underrated. Are you kidding me right now? You got you got to be kidding me right now with these numbers. These are rookie numbers, dude. And for some reason, okay, here we go. Like, look at this. What are these numbers, bro? 110,000 players? People just really don't know what a good game is nowadays, I gotta say, man. Like, how are you gonna have only a, an all-time peak of 110,000 players for one of the best video games that came out last year? What a joke, dude. Come on, gaming community, we can do better than this. We can do better than this, dude. Remnant 2 is amazing. But yeah, uh, this is definitely something that we'll be checking out on the 23rd when the DLC comes out. Uh, we're going to have to play this on PlayStation, right? I can't really play it on PC. I wish they would allow us to transfer our save files. Cause it's just right now with the, with the whole situation that I have uh, a PC here and a PC back at home. PC gaming has just become so much more convenient for me now that yeah i wish i wish i could just like hey let me just put my save file on pc boom good game doesn't necessarily mean popular true but again it's it's one of those games that's been around when people have been just like oh my god the industry is in such a bad bad uh space there's crossplay but not cross save yeah a lot of video games do crossplay but they don't do cross save you can do crossplay now on remnant 2 by the way that is a thing that we can do Oh, I'm literally playing Remnant 1 on my Steam Deck. Yeah, dude. I gotta play the other one. There's another game in the Remnant universe, which is uh, Kronos, I think, is the name of it. I gotta play that one. That one's amazing. Games like this exist, so you can say underrated. Yeah, true. By the way, guys, do remember, if you're enjoying the live stream, you can hit the like button. It really helps us out with the show. So, yeah. Now, we have a lot of news to to go over. Naturally, these are going to be like the next big four titles we're going to be covering here on the channel uh, after the Enshrouded interview. But you can expect a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of content around these bad boys. 
let's see if I can actually pump up my Final Fantasy 16 thing. I just killed, uh, I just killed Titan. I don't remember how many hours it is from Titan until the end of the game. There's probably still quite a bit. Still have to go to like the, the land of Barnabas and do all of that shenanigans. But at least side quests are really quick because I don't have to sit through the dialogue. I just skip everything now. <clears throat> just glad Gigantic came back. Bro, I still remember when I first played Gigantic. I was, uh, I was sitting next to a dude. His name was Thor and he looked like Thor. And he taught me how to play Gigantic. I don't think that dude is involved with that project anymore, though. I wonder. But that dude was awesome. That That's always the memory that I have of Gigantic, is being sat next to a dude that was called Thor, and he looked like Thor, and he taught me how to play the game. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. Hot take, Remnant 2 is kind of mid. That no, that that's not a hot take. That's just a bad take. That's it's a bad. You see, there there are takes that are hot, and then there's takes that's just bad. <laughs> oh man, it's your birthday today, Mad Shit seventy six. Congratulations, dude. Dude, we have a birthday right here on Khan's Anvil. Everybody say congratulations to Mad Shit seventy six. And remember to hit the like button. Each like on the stream is like, uh, I don't know, lighting up a candle for mad shit or something. <laughs> no, but seriously, dude, congratulations. Hope you, have a, hope you have a good day. My one criticism with 16 is that it peaked with Titan. Yeah, dude, I love the Titan fight. I do think that Titan fight's my favorite one. I also really like, you know, obviously the final fight's also fantastic. And the one against Bahamut, the Bahamut fight's really cool too. But like Titan fight is just just a beast. All right, but these are the titles that you can expect uh, to be hitting the channel uh, pretty soon. In the meantime, we got to talk once again about the nonsense that Ubisoft is doing. So here's the interesting thing: we all knew that the crew was going to be shutting down its servers. This is something that we were aware of. We've talked about it. We've talked about how this type of stuff should be illegal, how companies should actually consider potentially patching their games, particularly games that don't even use their multiplayer element all that much. They should just be patched to become single player games and then you could keep on playing them. That would be something that not only would be easy, because you're not going to tell me that Ubisoft can't just shut down the servers. All the files are client-side, bro. Get the hell out of here. You're not doing any server-side processing. You're not doing any of those shenanigans. The multiplayer was like, oh, every now and then you run into other players or whatever. It was not that big a deal. You're not going to tell me that you can't just remove that infrastructure and transform the crew into a single-player game? Like, super easy. Probably one, two people coding max could fix that in like a couple of weeks and you'd be like hey you know what we did right by you guys you guys supported our game blah 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 boom you can play it offline now that would have been the cool thing to do that would have been the pro consumer thing to do but ubisoft didn't do that ubisoft's like nah you know what screw you guys we're gonna shut down the servers and you can all go pound sand for all we care whatever now the interesting thing is that not only they did that but they're also stripping your license for the game. So what does this mean? They're straight up deleting the game from your library, depending on whether you have it on PlayStation or Xbox or on PC. Like, they're just like, they're taking it away. They're literally taking your license for the game away, which means you can't download it anymore. You can't do anything with it anymore. Now, naturally, you might be saying, well, if the servers are offline and you can't really play the game anymore, why do I care? And the reality is, is exactly because of the reason being pointed out here by this PC Gamer article. Squandering the hopes of fan servers and acting as a stark reminder of how volatile digital ownership is. Fan servers is something that people often do to maintain video games running on PC. And it's not just on PC, like we talked about in the last Cons Anvil episode, uh, we talked about how Nintendo is shutting down the, the 3DS shop, online servers, all of that stuff, as well as the Wii U one. All that stuff's getting shut down, but there's a company stepping up called Pretendo. We'll see if uh, 
if Nintendo is going to allow them to keep doing that, but they're basically going to have fan servers up so that people can keep on playing these video games uh, online. So they're basically going to continue supporting that hardware uh, for the foreseeable future, which is a really cool thing. And this could have been something that somebody would do with the crew as well. But Ubisoft said, no, we're going to leak the game from your friggin' accounts because we don't care. Which is absolutely ridiculous. We have here in the article, the downside of digital ownership has reared its ugly head. Let me actually lower the volume here a little bit. I feel like it's a little bit on the loud side. Digital, uh, the downside of digital ownership has reared its ugly head for enjoyers of Ubisoft's open world multiplayer racer, The Crew. The publisher has revoked its license for those who own on Ubisoft Connect, almost destroying fan ambitions to revive the game in both an offline and online format. The crew was pulled from sale back in December, with Ubisoft revealing that the servers would be shut down at the beginning of April. Frustratingly, despite a large portion of the game being doable in single player, the crew remained an online only endeavor because of greed. Because give me your money. The crew remained an online endeavor throughout its decade long lifespan that already rendered the game unplayable, but it seems Ubisoft is determined to take things one step further to stamp out any attempts to continue playing it past its expiry date. Fans began to notice earlier in the week that the license to the game had been snatched away from them. A message at the top of the game's library page reads, You no longer have access to this game. Why not check the store to pursue your adventures? It's also been moved to its own individual section in players' libraries listed under inactive games. Apparently, booting the game directly from the installation directory will still launch the game, but only in a demo mode. You now have a demo of the crew. The news was unsurprisingly gone down very poorly. This was the saddest, most ruthless decision I've ever seen in gaming history. Okay, that's maybe... <laughs> Whoa, dude. That's maybe a bit much. The saddest and most ruthless decision I've ever seen in gaming history? I would wager that some of the massive layoffs we've been getting in this industry are probably a little bit sadder and significantly more ruthless than them shutting down the crew. But, you know, that's just my thought on that. I will always fight for digital media. I love all the advantages it gives users all around the world. But this, we need protection on the national or European level. On the national, international level, to be honest. That when we purchase something, we need to have lifetime access to it, no matter what. Agreed. Agreed. Further Reddit user called it really abhorrent behavior that needs to stop being legal with another writing in an ideal world provoking a license like this should entitle the buyer to a refund. Exactly. I'm not sure why they're even bothering doing this. The game isn't playable anymore. What exactly is the harm in keeping the game available for download for those who have purchased it? Server space? Is Ubisoft really that cheap? No! They're cheaper! It's worth noting that it appears you can technically still download the game on Steam, but any attempt to play is follow up with a request to input game key. So it's like, even if somebody does, uh, you know, a fan server, you're still not going to be able to play the legal copy of the game. And let me tell you something, in a situation like this one, I will just straight up say, just pirate the bitch. You can probably pirate it, I'm assuming. Somebody's cracked the crew. Somebody probably has it running offline. And I'll tell you what, do that, you know, yo ho ho in a bottle of rum. Fuck Ubisoft, dude. I don't give a damn. Like, that's some bullshit. You can't just like take games away like this. This is fucking stupid. But on top of it, the other thing is like we, we've had, this, this just shows you the future of digital media. This is where every piece of digital media eventually ends, particularly always online games. Like I've mentioned in a previous uh, episode of Khan's Anvil, that this is the future also for Godfall. Now, I don't know how many people even remember Godfall. Let me bring up some gameplay to see if people remember this. Because I actually had some fun with the game. Let me see. Godfall gameplay. Do we have like a recent trailer or something? Well, actually, I should have my own Godfall gameplay, no? Yeah, here we go. Uh, this was a two-hour live stream that we have right here. It's like, I don't know how many of you guys remember this game. I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I thought it was pretty fun. Had a blast playing it. Played all the way. I really enjoyed the parry mechanics that you had with the, with the shield and whatnot. It was really fun. So, yeah, this is a game that sooner rather than later, you're going to see take the exact same route as the crew. It's just going to be deleted. It's going to be gone. It's going to disappear from your libraries and you're never going to see it again. You guys remember this? Yeah, I enjoyed it as well, Dave Jennings, but eventually they're just going to remove it. 
This was actually a multiplayer game, and never once did I play the game in multiplayer, which I thought was interesting. But yeah, you know. Uh, I think the game is still available at this point, but eventually it's not going to be available anymore. That's just going to be a thing. That's what we're going to have to deal with moving forward with digital purchases and all of that jazz. So keep that in mind. But yeah, all of this stuff eventually is going to end. Recently, we've had another example. Like, I don't know if you guys remember when the demo for Stellar Blade came out. It was leaked ahead of time. And PlayStation were just able to just straight up go into your hard drive and delete it. And I was like, hot damn. <laughs> That's how it is, huh? You just, you just go right in there and elite that bitch, and it's gone. Now, that's a completely different situation, but it kind of illustrates how easily it is for companies to actually just go in and delete stuff when all you have is a digital license. And let, let's, not, let's not kid around. If you actually ever bothered to read one of the end user license agreements, you know that even if you have a physical version of the game, Technically speaking, you don't really own it. You've never really owned video games. Everything is just a license. You own a license. The thing is, obviously, from a practical standpoint, what we like to what we like to do is we like to actually own our video games, which is why it used to be the situation where you could actually go and buy a physical version of a video game, and that would be something that you would have in perpetuity. To some extent, you can still do that in some situations, but it's definitely been something that is coming under attack. And um, this is something that is especially true with our friends here at Ubisoft, which like I mentioned last time, there's also that whole thing where they don't want you owning any games because what they really want you to do is to jump into their subscription model. Why do you think there's um, a $130 version of Star Wars Outlaws? And then they, in the same page, they show you that you can just, you know, do their Ubisoft Connect Plus thing for 18 euros, play the game, and then be done with it. This is them making you comfortable with not owning your video games so that they can just keep deleting it. Because at the end of the day, they don't want you playing old games, which is one of the things that is happening in the industry. A lot of people are resorting to playing old games rather than playing more recent ones because you know, the old games are still good. It's not like they, they have an expiration date where they're no longer good and now they suck or something like that. So Ubisoft doesn't want that. They're like, no, you need to be playing the latest game. You need to be always buying new games and playing the new ones. We don't want you playing the old ones. And this is one of the things that you're going to be seeing with um, Star Wars Outlaws as well, because just in case you weren't aware... Uh, this is from Wario64. You should be familiar with this account. This dude like tracks deals and whatnot. And according to the box art of Star Wars Outlaws, you're going to need internet just to install the game. And guess what happens 10 years from now? Guess what happens to this copy of Star Wars Outlaws that you bought for $130 if you bought them, you know, the complete version of the game. So a lot of people like to say, well, that's just the most expensive version of the game. No, 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 no. That's the version of the game that they didn't chop up into tiny bitty pieces to sell you the remainder of the game, okay? So that's a complete version of a game. So you buy the complete version of the game. You don't even get the whole game on the disc, okay? You need to connect online to download the rest of the game. And if you want to play the game 10 years from now when the servers go offline, tough titties, baby, because Ubisoft's going to be there taking their cut, deleting the license from your console and telling you to get bent and buy the latest edition of their newer game as opposed to actually supporting video game preservation, which is something that we need to take much, much more seriously. But you know, this is something that you can expect from Star Wars Outlaws. Eventually, you're not going to have access to it anymore. It is what it is. A lot of the times, it literally give you practically a blank disc. Yeah, there was a recent Call of Duty game where the, the somebody saw how much data there was on the disc, and it was like less than 50 megs or less than 100 megs or something like that. So basically, the disc was a, a fancy coaster. And the discs in that situation, by the way, you know what they become? They just become a form of DRM that is another point of failure that gets introduced into your machine. So not only do you not have the benefit of having the game in the eventuality that servers go down or you just don't have access to the internet for the day and you need to like install the game. Nope, can't do that. 
can't play the game without connecting to the internet. But not only that, but on top of that, the, the you have to always have the disc on after you install the game. So it acts as a form of DRM. And in case your drive stops working, you can't play the game anymore. So it's basically a digital purchase that has an additional layer of DRM, which is like, bro, there's just so many disadvantages with physical copy that is absolutely ridiculous. Because it's like, if the video game is going to be, it, it, if I can't even play it offline, what is even the point? Because it's a single player game. You know, you will be able to play it offline after you install it once. But if you don't have access to internet or 10 years from now when the servers go down, tough titties. It's over for you. Over. We're concerned with the various patches games get these days. How can one get a physical copy of the game to have the latest patch that comes two years later? You can't. Like, for instance, uh, the perfect example of that would be Monster Hunter Rise. If you buy the physical version of Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak... You're getting Monster Hunter Rise 1.0. So it doesn't include Sunbreak, and it doesn't include even like the 3.0 patch that we had for the original Monster Hunter Rise, which is terrible. <laughs> it's absolutely terrible, which is something that I don't like. <laughs> like, I, I would actually buy the physical version of Sunbreak if it included Sunbreak, but it doesn't. So it kind of sucks, but yeah. Work on your video the other day on Outlaws. You were going to talk about specs for running the game, but you never touched on it. Is there any points where you're going to bring up? It was mostly the online thing because I thought that um, the the always online requirement was actually going to be required for when you were playing the game. And I figured that would be something that would be listed under specs. But no, you don't need to be always online to play. You just need to be online for your first installation and activation. Uh, so it was a moot point. Basically, it's physical DRM. Yep. The point is to forcibly lose my old products so or you're forced to buy my new product. Yeah, exactly. That is the point. But that is the, the situation with Star Wars Outlaws uh, and Ubisoft as a whole being just scummy company with scummy practices and whatnot. Interestingly enough, the, the, the biggest thing that people are still discussing is whether or not the, the character is ugly. That's still one of the biggest things. And it, it's like, look, the character itself, the, the, this is my opinion on this, the character itself was deliberately made uglier than the model uh, that posed for this character. This is a fact. And I think that people that are trying to dance around this as if, oh, but the character is actually pretty. and is a, I'm not saying the, character's, the character is bad looking. I'm not saying the character is ugly. I'm saying the character is uglier than the model that they used as a basis for the character. And this is intentional. The reason this is intentional is because they want her to, to look rough. My biggest thing that I find uh, maybe less attractive is the, the hairstyle. I don't like this hairstyle at all. But other than that, it doesn't bother me. Now, I know that for some people, they're like, oh, you, you got to be on this side or on this side. How can you like want to play Stellar Blade? And then you say that this character isn't ugly I, because I really like the character in Stellar Blade. This character I'm kind of like neutral to. Don't really care. Doesn't bother me. I would still play the game. What bothers me is the business practices around the goddamn thing. That's what bothers me. The other thing is also uh, some of the animations. Like if you actually pay attention to some of the animations in this trailer, I feel like they look a little bit unnatural. Like even this one where they're kind of like, see how they're doing the editing on this scene where she pistol whips this dude? It's like Hollywood camera shakiness, like super fast angles and all that stuff because it doesn't look natural. Because this is one of the things where I feel that Ubisoft really kind of sucks. And this is one of the criticisms that we should kind of like take more seriously is the animations i feel like they could have done a much better job with animations on this game but you know that's one of the things where i feel like ubisoft has never really excelled at is animations and that would be one of the things because people are comparing like how beautiful e from stellar blade is to how beautiful this character in star wars outlaws is and to me it's like look at these animations bro and we're going to be looking at a stellar blade video later on but yeah All of the animations, they look so weird. Yeah, they do. I agree. That, But again, that's one of the things that's like characteristic of Ubisoft games. I just feel like their animators have a lot to learn. Or maybe it has to do with the engine that they use or whatever. 
But I feel like their animation department definitely needs to put in a little bit more work nowadays. But, you know, it is what it is. Or can't you see the report that the Java quest shown in the trailer is actually behind a season pass? Yeah. I talked about it last time, too, that I think is super scummy. See, those are the things that we really need to be talking about. How the, the mission, an, an exclusive mission for one of the most iconic characters in the Star Wars franchise, Jabba the Hutt, is behind a paywall. Are you kidding me? One of the most iconic characters, particularly for a game that is about scoundrels. Not only one of the most iconic Star Wars characters in general, but on top of it, one of the most relevant characters for a scoundrel type story. And that mission is the one you're going to put behind a paywall. Being an absolute scumbag doesn't even begin to describe that goddamn behavior. Jabba behind the paywall. Yeah, how, how adequate, right? Expecting Star Wars not to be a cash grab. Are you kidding me? Yeah, challenge level impossible. Challenge level impossible. What paywall? I mean, you don't get the job of the hut mission in the standard version of the game. You need to buy the deluxe edition of the game in order to gain access to the job of the hut mission, in case you're curious. Luke Paywalker, exactly. Exactly. Oh my god, we're gonna crash YouTube over here because I have too many windows open. It's dishonest. Yeah, dude. If Jabba ran the payment for this game, that's how he would do it. I think Jabba would actually be more magnanimous. I think Jabba the Hut is less greedy than Ubisoft. Wait, they literally made a mission exclusive to an edition? I can't believe you guys don't know this yet. I thought we talked about this. We talk, I mean, I know we talked about this already. But I'll show you guys. Like, look, if you go over here, hit the pre-order button. It's going to take you over here to the different editions. Hey, where's the different editions? Oh, here we go. Oh, did they... They changed the screen? Or is it not loading properly? Ah, here we go. See, here's the standard edition. And then in the gold edition... Look at this. Season pass. The Jabba's Gambit exclusive mission available at launch. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. That's what you get. That's what you get. I don't know if they give you more details about that specific mission, but yeah. There it is. Work on should the gaming industry tone down in visual quality and focus on more important factors like gameplay and story? Thinking of how Elden Ring graphics aren't great, but the style holds high. You know what is a really good example of that? Stellar Blade. Stellar Blade, curiously enough, a lot of people are focusing on like on what the character looks and all of this stuff. And that's actually a, a really neat trick that they've pulled off. Like, let, let me show you guys. Let me show you guys. This 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 is really cool. Stellar Blade Rakan should bring up my yeah, Stellar Cheeks gameplay. So like if we actually go here. Is there one where I go closer to a wall? Because that would enable me to really showcase my point. It's kind of dark in here. Okay, this should be close enough. Okay, so like, if you look at this image, I wish that there was a bit more brightness to it. If you look at this image, right, you'll notice that Eve, the main character, is like super high detail. This is in balanced mode, by the way, because the game has like two different modes that you can have. Uh, or actually, it was three different modes that you could have, which is you can go all out resolution, you can go all out frame rate, or you can go balanced, which balances out the resolution mode and the frame rate mode. And that's the mode that I'm playing in right now. And if you notice, like mega detail on Eve. There's mega detail on the enemies as well. There's mega detail on the little drone that follows her around. Super detailed, super, you know, high, uh, high resolution textures, all of that stuff cranked up to the max. Looks gorgeous. Then you look at the scenery around her, not the case. Like, look here. Does this texture right here look particularly impressive? No. And you want to know why? Because it doesn't need to be. Because it doesn't matter. 
because you're gonna look at this for one tenth of a second before you jump over here and jump over to that balcony and the people that obsess over the quality of this thing needing like an 8k texture with surface scattering bump mapping and all of that other bullshit it doesn't matter it doesn't matter at all what we need is pitch perfect buttocks on eve that's the thing <laughs> no but seriously the detail on the characters and the enemies and the animations that's where it matters the level does not need to be nearly as detailed and this way they can have the game still run at around 60 fps and it still looks really good the one thing that they need to let me do in the final game though is get rid of that goddamn uh film grain filter that they have on top of the game i'm gonna knock points down in my review if that if there's not an option for me to get rid of that shit i'm gonna tell you right now but yeah see that's the thing the this is how we tackle that specific question that you were making you put the detail and the budget for the detail where it matters and you cut down on that detail where it doesn't matter just make sure that in the final rendition it still looks good it doesn't need to look pitch perfect you know super uh, high resolution it, it doesn't need that for what for a piece of rubble who cares and the people that care shouldn't care but yeah so eve is the type of woman you like or are you still the handler's favorite look i like women in general okay i'm a women enjoyer all right I'm a woman enjoyer. I don't have a specific type. Like, show me the picture and I'll tell you if I like it or not. <laughs> Sir, with the sheer gaming library that Nintendo Switch has now and in seven plus years of ongoing console generation, how do you see these games and services to work out for us along another 10 years? Uh, I have no idea what you're trying to say there. How those things are even like related but i'm assuming there's going to be a switch too so yeah from a dwarven woman <laughs> really likes aloy i do you don't like aloy You can tell me you don't like Aloy? Like Aloy is ugly or something? People are crazy. Goddamn right I like Aloy. <clears throat> I played both Horizon games. Love both of them. I think I liked... Uh, Zero Dawn more than Forbidden West because Zero Dawn's story I think was better than Forbidden West's but yeah Aloy is real so you mean her I think it's her right she's the model Zero Dawn had way better story yeah this, the story of Zero Dawn is really good I really like the story of Horizon Zero Dawn. Very underrated, in my opinion, because people always talk about how good the game is. Not enough people talk about how good the story of that game is. Banquise, thank you very much for the souls. Tip of the hat. Appreciate the support. Uh, although I disagree with you. I don't think she's got a, a boring design. If you read everything and the lore is great. Yeah, it is. Absolutely it is. I don't see it. To me, she's hideous. That's fine. Maybe she's not your type. I like it. Uh, which one is this? Okay, this is the thing. I can close down. <sighs> At some point, she looked like Nikocado Avocado. Was that edited? Yes. Yes, it was. People edited the crap out of a lot of... Um, a lot of pictures that you see online for, for Aloy, for some reason. They edited a lot of that stuff.
Could you imagine dating a game model and playing the game she modeled for? Would it be weird? No. Why would it? Like, do you think that actors who date each other and then they watch like, or not even date each other, but like an, an actor's spouse, you think that they're going to watch the, the movies of their better half and it's going to be weird? No, it's fine. Wouldn't be a problem at all. I think I pulled up most of the topics that people wanted me to talk about here. Uh, there were talks about a Final Fantasy IX remake. I don't know anything about Final Fantasy IX remake. Oh, I guess uh, this message was sent after I checked. Wait, what? The God Emperor. Let's talk about how you are biased about Final Fantasy VIII by nostalgia. Shut up! Final Fantasy VIII was a great Final Fantasy. You shut up. I don't care. Future of Dragon's Dogma 2. I don't know anything about the future of Dragon's Dogma 2. I'm hoping that they're going to add... Uh, I want a full-on expansion, which I believe they're probably already working on a full-on expansion for Dragon's Dogma 2. So that is definitely one of the things that I want. But I would also like them to add some, some new things to Dragon's Dogma, namely... We need like a hard mode or we need some scaling implemented because I've been playing through New Game Plus uh, every now and then and even purposefully limiting myself by playing with two fighters and I've been playing most of the game with just the two fighters. Recently, I actually brought on Mr. Tummy Giggle's um, mage, but I'm going to get rid of her soon um, just because there are some enemies that you can't kill without magic and i'm playing two fighters but i'm also thinking maybe i'll just have molten fury on my character and i'll have dragon's dogma on my pawn so that way i can still hit with magical damage whenever i need to do that even though it's not the most elegant of solutions i did upgrade molten fury all the way but the damage is still kind of like meh so yeah What if Dragon's Dogma 2 got title update for story and then expansion? No, I'd rather just go straight for the expansion. I don't want a, a title update for story. I would want a title update to add a couple of new monsters and add scaling into the difficulty. By the way, Mr. Tummy Giggles, I got some bad news, okay? My, um, my pawn had sex with your pawn and now she's got Dragon's Plague. <laughs> work on how do you deal with gaming burnout i've never been burned out of gaming i might get burned out of an individual game and how i deal with that is i just play a different one but i've never gotten burned out of gaming sometimes i feel burned out on content creation because like i just sit here and think about it for hours and hours about what video i should be doing uh, with, that is very frustrating. That is an extremely frustrating situation when I'm just like sitting here at the office and I'm like, okay, I need to work on this video. What am I going to say on this video? How's that going to work in the algorithm? What thumbnail am I going to make? Is this video worth it? Should I work on it? Is it worth And four hours will pass and I'm just literally sitting here looking at Twitter, looking at YouTube, trying to figure out this imaginary video that I want to put out. Yesterday was one of those days, by the way, because I, I knew I wanted to put out a video for Enshrouded, but I didn't know how to title it appropriately in a way that would make sense, because it was essentially to kind of prepare the algorithm for the cons cast that we have releasing today. And that is something that is very frustrating. So yeah, I, while I do get content creation burnout, and I get that often, I never get video game burnout. Like, because the thing is, there's always another game that I want to play. You could literally stop making video games and I would probably still have games that would last me for the next 10 years that I would play, including some stuff that I would want to replay. Like, for instance, I want to replay Xenoblade Chronicles X. I really do. 
I can't. I don't have time, but I really want to replay Xenoblade Chronicles X. I missed that game. I missed that world. I haven't even finished Xenoblade Chronicles 3, and I want to replay Xenoblade Chronicles X. That's just an example, right? I want to play Persona 5 Royal. I want to play, um, you know, I need to finish Final Fantasy uh, 16, Final Fantasy mode to get the DLC. I need to... Um, What's that? What's that other one? Um, I need to play Armored Core Six because I haven't finished New Game Plus Plus. I want to play Elden Ring. It's like there, there's so many games you could you could literally like not release video games for the next ten years, and I would still be playing video games nonstop. Easy. Sounds almost like a form of writer's block. Yeah, the James two two one. I guarantee you that is probably one of the things that content creators struggle with the most. Is like, oh man, I need to make a video. What do I need to make a, what am I going to make a video on? What is the topic? What is the thing? That is, this is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to have Khan's Anvil, was just a show where I could just sit down, talk about stuff with you guys, almost, you know, like live gaming talk show, because that actually takes me away from that mindset of, oh my God, I got to, got to think of a video. <laughs> do you think Dragon's Dogma 2 will get a hard mode? I hope it does. I hope it does. You need to play Outer Wilds and Metal Gear Rising? Dude, for a second, for a split second, I thought you were talking about Metal Gear Survive. And I was like, the fuck do you mean I got to play Metal Gear Survive? What kind of cruel and unusual torture is this? <laughs> I do, That's another one. I want to play Outer Wilds at some point. I don't have time. But yeah, so gaming burnout, I don't have that. Never had that. Not in my whole life. Been gaming for, I don't know, how many years? I think I started gaming when I was like seven. Seven, I think, is when I started gaming. Uh, I learned how to operate my dad's Amstrad PC to play Space Invaders. So considering that I'm going to be 42 this year, seven, 35 years. I've been playing video games for 35 years and not once. Have I felt like I'm burned out of gaming? I felt burned out of games. Usually I just play another one. <laughs> no, I've never played the Surus Wrath. That's another one that I would love to, to play as well. Never played a Surus Wrath. No, but I, 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 I would like to play Metal Gear Rising as well. See, the, the, again, like I said, there are so many good games out there. And there's no way that, you know, I would ever get burned out. Near Replicant, that's another one. Hell, I got a code from Square Enix from that game and I never even played it. <laughs> I never even played it. Uh. But yeah, there's so many good games. Haze Darkness? I probably would, but I don't really do a lot of strategy. See, that's one of the examples where it wouldn't make sense to make videos about that game in my channel because the algorithm would slam me into the dirt. I would still do it if I had the time. Like, if there was nothing coming out around Unicorn Overlord, I'd absolutely have played it. Absolutely. Did you play Devil May Cry on the channel? Uh, did I stream that on Twitch? I think I might have streamed that on Twitch. I was still going through that phase where I would stream half things, some stuff on Twitch, some stuff on here. Most of the times I would prefer just streaming everything here and condensing everything into one channel. But sometimes when I do off-topic stuff, Twitch is just easier. But I don't remember if I played Devil May Cry 5 here on the channel or if I played it on Twitch. Pal World Dating Sim? Are they actually doing that? Urukan Persona or Shin Megami Tensei? Personally, I prefer Persona, but I never played too much Shin Megami Tensei. I just like the Persona vibe more. You never played the OG Nier, even though I sent it to you. Exactly, Gru. <laughs> Still have... I love that you sent me that box, though. Comes with a goddamn manual, dude. I'll never forget that. I miss games having manuals. <sighs> Most Steam, most people have more games they can play. True. So anyways, um, there's a, there was a new video that they put out for Stellar Blade. 
I figured we'd uh we'd watch that. Let me go ahead, pause this. See what this is all about. Stellar Blade, the journey behind the scenes, PS5 games. The inspiration for creating this game came unexpectedly. It was when I saw the news about the taxi drivers going on strike. It's a job that will be replaced by artificial intelligence. And I was thinking, what if this happened to me? If humans can be completely replaced, what does this mean? The curiosity about these questions was the beginning of Stellar Blade. What an interesting topic. I think about this all the time, by the way. I do. I think about this type of stuff all the time. I'm like, I mean, you know, you have AIs generating video now. As a matter of fact, if you actually go on YouTube right now and you, you're you the type of person that enjoys consuming documentaries on YouTube or long form content, I've noticed that a lot of the long, whenever I'm curious about a topic, right, I'll look up a documentary on YouTube sometimes and I'll watch it. And I've noticed that a lot of those have been completely replaced by AI voiceovers. Which is just not as interesting. Not not just AI voiceovers. It seemed like they're also written by ChatGPT because it's like this verbal diarrhea of just like blah, 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 blah about a specific topic. And and the, the other thing that I've noticed is that you can tell that there's not that much effort being placed on if those. I could be so grossly incandescent. Because... I don't really retain the knowledge as much when I'm watching those in the background. Whereas if I'm watching something that was actually created by someone for the purpose of learning a topic, right? I'll usually be able to retain some of that knowledge. And with the ones that are generated by AI, it, it's insane. And for, for a while, I remember that I was looking up about information about a specific topic. I don't remember what the topic was. Every single long form video was an AI thing. So I'd start listening to it and I, then I would notice, wait, this intonation, this is AI crap then i would go look up another one oh here we go again <laughs> uh jv doc thank you very much for being grossing and asking for 11 months as a thing thank you sir tip of the hat really appreciate the support thank you thank you thank you no way i will ever be able to replace you <laughs> i don't know about that <laughs> stellar blade is a very enchanting game with no equal in the current landscape of console games. You can feel the excitement when you first play the game. It's set in a post-apocalyptic era. There was a time when this bar used to be full of people. We tried many things we thought were impossible before. I think this game will surprise you. Exciting. <laughs> Exciting. Seven five three one. Pod landing complete. Stellar Blade tells the story of a female warrior fighting against unidentified life forms. The desolate Earth is dominated. Desolate Earth. By the way, this this fight in the in the demo was actually really cool but the the fight on the actual boss that you get to do after you finish the demo you can do a fight against the boss with a more advanced version of the characters that was awesome and the animation work in this game this is exactly what i was talking about when in the earlier segment we were talking about the um star wars outlaws now the animation doesn't look good animation in this game by oh crap a spider just dropped down on me go away animation on this game by uh, comparison looks absolutely insane i love it it is over the top but it, it's not even just about being over the top it's just it's believable over the top which is really cool the desolate earth is dominated by enemies called nativa 
where Naitiba suddenly appeared on Earth, attacked humans, and drove them out to space. If you play the game further, you may find that this is a story about humanity. It's hard to talk in more detail. If I tell more, it would be a spoiler. Yes, no spoilers, please. Eve is one of the survivors of the airborne squad, along with her crucial ally, Taki. Take my hand. The third character is... Let's hope Taki is not too crucial of an ally, taking into... Con taking into account what happens in the demo. <laughs> For those of you that haven't played the demo yet, this literally happens in the beginning portion of the demo. Taki just gets destroyed. <laughs> Lily, a technician who worked as an engineering support in the Airborne Squad. She arrived on Earth before our protagonist. Lily Artemis II. But you can just call me Lily. Next is Adam. A survivor on Earth who works to rescue her from the crisis. I love Adam these, has survived these ships. on a devastated Earth by avoiding enemies. Something serious seems to have happened. These characters form a party and embark on various adventures, which is the main focus of the game. We don't start by drawing the characters first. We actually search and reference the costumes first. We buy them, have a model wear them, and then scan them in 3D. The idea was to create something of a higher quality and with more realistic visuals. And I thought that this was the perfect technology to achieve that. When I initially decided to create this game, many people thought we were out of our minds. Because in South Korea, mobile gaming dominates the market. Thank you for going against the current. Thank God, dude. Thank God for that. Oh my God. It's, it's, it's one of those things where in a, a lot of times... Um, you know, companies in Asia, they're just like, well, our, our thing is the mobile market, so we'll just make mobile games forever. And it's very refreshing to see certain companies in the Asian market come out and be like, yeah, we know that the money is in mobile, but we just want to make this game. Like another good example of that is, um, what's, what's their name? Psy Games? Psy Games with the recent release of Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, which is an amazing game. Absolutely loved it. I thought, you know, it was a little bit on the easy side. But other than that, absolutely loved what I've played of Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. And this is coming from a company that was doing basically gotcha, which I believe these guys also have a, a gotcha, right? The 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 bubble butt shooting uh, thingamabob. I forget the name. Nikkei Goddess of something. Uh, yeah, which is just like anime big butts that jiggle as they shoot their guns. So they have uh, their own gotcha thing going. But they were like, no, we want to make a console game. And I'm super happy they did that. And the console market was nearly non-existent. These days, getting to work on a AAA game in Korea is quite a rare feat, to be honest. This is my first AAA console game project. We were worried if we could do this well. But as we progressed, we became more and more ambitious. I felt a sense of mission to do it now because it was now or never. I am detecting the frequencies of an Alpha Nativa coming from Matrix 11. <clears throat> I wish you luck. Even the word monster cannot describe it well enough. The game's main villains are called Neitiba and are monstrous creatures who took over a desolate planet Earth. At the design stage, we wanted to do something a little different from the usual monsters. To be able to maximize that feeling of discomfort. When creatures don't conform to the human form, they elicit discomfort due to fundamental differences in appearance. 
I really like the concept of the monster in director Bong Joon-ho's The Host, so I contacted the person who created the monster from the film. Tang Hee-chul joining the production. This game, like in that scene with the ships coming down, gives me some friggin' Evangelion vibes. And some of the monster designs also give me a little bit of Evangelion vibes. Some of the other ones give me Bayonetta vibes, because Bayonetta also had these angelic-looking monsters in, in Bayonetta 2. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's some vibes there. Was an important turning point for me. He basically shared with us all the know-how gained at the Weta workshop. Thanks to that, I could feel my skill set for a notch. The Hammerhead Horse. One of the unique things about us is that we design monsters in a very unique way by creating actual sculpture mock-ups. This helps tremendously with the representation of mass, a character's sense of presence and proportions in general. So, the result is a type of creature that's certainly peculiar and in a way even grotesque. In Stellar Blade, there are crucial moments of decision-making. The game's choices might lead you to deep contemplation. But the game never forces that upon you. This project started with one question. What is humanity? Is humanity something that can be lost? Or can it be replaced? I'm excited to see how players feel about that. Hmm. I think you'll naturally be curious about what happens next. Yes, very. That's enough for introductions. Oh, they're gonna do another one. Nice. I mean, I'm hyped. What I've played of um, what I've played of the game, I thought was pretty fun. Like I said, I I did feel a little bit of stiffness from the controls, but that might just be something that I'll get over after I get enough practice and more playtime in. But I'm super curious to see what it's gonna be like, particularly after what he said, how the the whole idea came about because of AI kind of like replacing humans. Definitely getting a lot of near automata vibes on that as well. Yeah, I, th I think it'll be interesting. I think, I think that'll be interesting. The other thing was also the soundtrack. The soundtrack was on point in the demo. Again, near automata vibes in there. Well, yeah. we'll see. We'll see how it all pans out, but... I think Stellar Blade is going to be a really, really good game. I suspect that's going to be the case. Most likely, we're going to be doing uh, streaming for this game, by the way, because uh, I did um, I did a community post where I asked you guys, what was your preference? Uh, let me just see here. We did a community post for it. Where I asked, right now, my plan is to just live stream Stellar Blade once it becomes available. What are your thoughts for a series? Uh, and then I gave the example of what it would be for an LP, which would be kind of like what I did with Rise of Ronin, that video that has the first four hours or something. And right now with the votes, it seems like the people that do care would prefer it to be live streamed. And most people don't really care if it's live stream or let's play. So I'm probably doing a live stream. Uh, I'm probably going to do something similar to what we did with Dragon's Dogma 2. So if I get early access for whatever reason, then I'll play a bit. I'll do the probably like a beginner's guide and a uh, an impressions video and my, my thoughts video and then we'll just stream the whole thing so that means that potentially won't be like a full-on first time doing it or whatever but there might still be things that i haven't done by the time that uh the game release so we'll see how that is but yeah it's probably looking like a live stream project more so than traditional lps that just seems to be uh, the way that these things are going to go. But yeah, I'm excited. I don't know if you guys are excited or not, but yeah, it's looking pretty good. Interestingly enough, however, uh, that's not how everybody sees Stellar Blade. 
There's a lot of people that are upset about it. But one of the things that I've noticed is that there's like this rivalry forming online right now. And it is a rivalry between Stellar Blade and Star Wars Outlaws. Because you have the people that uh, that are upset at the fact that uh, Eve is a more sexualized character, more sexy character, and all of that stuff. And those are the same people that are like, oh, the, the, the Star Wars Outlaws model is this, and Eve, Eve is that, and you guys just want to masturbate to Eve and all of that stuff. There's like, there's definitely a, um, a rivalry between the, the fandoms of both games. Not even, I don't, I don't even know if it's the fandoms or if it's just mainstream media kind of like stoking the flames. We're going to be looking at some of those examples here in a second. But I figured because I had seen this popping off, I was like, okay, let's, let's ask the question. Let's say, <clears throat> let's say that you guys could only have one of these two games. You can only have either Stellar Blade or Star Wars Outlaws. And I made that question, I posted that, and... The results are pretty telling. <laughs> For starters, that's a lot of votes. Because usually, you know, you're like, oh, but you have 200,000 subscribers, blah, 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 blah. Uh, a lot of my 200,000 subs are kind of like dead accounts from like the olden days. People that moved on from YouTube or just moved on from consuming my content. But even still, a lot of the, a lot of the people that I actually check the community tab. So actually getting 8,000 votes is a lot. We got 8.4 thousand votes and 84% of people said I would just play Stellar Blade rather than play Outlaws, which says a lot. But I think that a big part of that is also because the Outlaws, uh, you know, business model and all of that stuff, right? But the thing is, some of these people are getting weird. GameSpot editor Jessica Cogswell attacks gamers as incel gamer dudes incel gamer dudes previously shared animus against white people oh what that doesn't surprise me at all GameSpot editor Jessica Cogswell took the social media to attack video game players as incel gamer dudes after pre here's the here's the thing that I gotta ask whenever it comes to these types of subjects do people actually believe that, you know, you're going to play Stellar Blade to masturbate? You have porn. It's free. You can just go look at porn. I don't... I don't understand. It's like, so... For instance, if, if I like the model of Eve, does that, does that mean that me, father of two, happily married man, at 42 years of age, I'm an incel? <laughs> at the end of March, Cogswell wrote on X, man, I don't know what all these incel gamer dudes are expecting games to have hot characters and characters representative of them at the same time. Well, at these replies get a life weirdos. When did we ever say we wanted representation every other fucking time? Your collective tweets is about how woke characters and women are in every role and you miss cis white men being allowed and think, oh God, oh God, it's, it's one. I didn't read this article ahead of time. Oh God. I don't even feel like finishing reading it at this point. Really, dude? Here's one of the things that I will say. Over the last couple of years, I have seen people use the term gamers as a derogatory word. Like they, they always like to come up and say, ooh, gamers, TM, as if it's like some own or something. The point of it is, I don't like generalizations. Every community has bad apples, like Jessica Cogswell would be an example of a bad apple in mainstream media because of the way that she conducts herself in social media. But at the end of the day, if you don't like gamers TM, why exactly are you looking at a place, why, why are you working at a place like uh, GameSpot if you don't like gamers TM? 
I don't think that gamers is like a derogatory word. I think that there are some people in the community that are a little bit weird, but every community has them. There's like, this is just a weird thing for me, you know? We have the same example with uh, IGN France, uh, where they were like upset and saying that, uh, no problem, go tell that to the women who are hit, killed, denigrated, or commit suicide because they cannot live up to the fictional standards expected by men. Well, what about the portrayal of men in video games? We're all, the, all like big, buff, muscly, in shape guys. I'm a fat guy. I can't live up to those expectations either. It's, the problem is not the sexy design itself, except that it sucks compared to others. But hey, that doesn't matter. But the percentage of males who will only want this type of fictional body in reality. I mean, if people actually believe that, they're the ranged. It's like, <laughs> but not to mention that she is scanned from an actual model. So it's not a fictional body. It does exist, although very high standards. Obviously, we understand that this does not shock people who think that women are objects or must obey and be beaten. Like, where the fuck does this even come from? I like attractive women. That means you like women to get beat. What? <laughs> this design makes a sigh and roll our eyes and we laugh at anybody who needs it, man or woman, but that's it. This cert certainly clashing remark in the text which targets the entire creative process not necessarily a specific design or a game direct this is obvious to anyone knows a little french only has this impact because of a good portion of gamers have become too fragile due to being fed the pit oh good lord fucking hell dude jesus christ again i must question why do you work in video games <laughs> what you're clearly not having a good fucking time holy shit Whew, God damn. This is insane. This, this is just absolutely insane -o territory, dude. insane -o territory Are they biased against sexy women? It's like, bro, it, it's the whole thing back. I, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in the day, we had this example. Uh, I don't know if we still have it. Um... Dragon's Crown, Sexy Dwarves. It was actually called Dwarfgate. Is this article still? <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys remember this one. This is from 2013. Oh, Jason Schreier wrote this one. Game developers really need to stop letting teenage boys design their characters. <laughs> the story is... Oh my god, they removed it! This story has gotten a little bit bigger over the past couple of days, and I've apologized for insulting Dragon's Crown artist George Kamitani. For more context, check up our follow-up right here. <laughs> I guess he changed his mind. But like, basically, when he did this, the, um, did, did they not show the Dwarven thing? They did not show. Oh, man. I wanted to see the sexy Dwarves. Because like, what happened was the artists... The artist basically posted and he said, Oh, you didn't like you didn't like my image? Let's see if you like this one. Oh, it's not it's not available anymore. Does anybody have a oh here it is? Boom. This is the one. <laughs> so the artist that designed this character, which was the thing that Jason Schreier was complaining about. He basically went and said, It seems Mr. Jason Schreier of Kotaku is pleased also neither I guess this is a rough translation, but basically saying that he didn't like with our sorcerer or Amazon. The art of direction which he likes was prepared. <laughs> it's true. These big manly dwarves. Dude, this was like the most giga chat thing ever. I was like, okay. 
You, you don't like the sorceress in the Amazon? I got what you need right here, brother. <laughs> I got what you need right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god this this was so good dude this is so good but yeah that that's like the thing you see that this is not a new thing there's always for some reason people always like to uh, you know harp on when characters are too sexy or whatever and they get like all upset about it because the bayonetta saw the same thing which i find interesting now because i've seen articles where people are saying stuff like oh bayonetta at least wasn't was an empowering female protagonist or something like that it's like motherfucker you know damn well when bayonetta came out you wrote the same shit you're writing for stellar blade don't lie you did the same shit. I saw it. I saw the articles with my own eyes back in the day of everybody trashing Bayonetta for the, the sexiness. It's like, get the fuck out of here. This is some bullshit, dude. So it's like, people have always been upset whenever there's a sexy character in the game. And it's like, whatever, dude. Whatever. You, get, you, go, you go do what you want. I don't care. Bayonetta near same crap. Yeah, exactly. Don't believe your lying eyes. True. Same thing happened with Tifa. Didn't people complain about a nerf to Tifa's uh, assets? <laughs> I've I've heard that Final Fantasy VII fans were not particularly pleased when the remake came out because there was a nerf to Tifa's assets. <laughs> Same thing happened with two of you guys remember how uh, Yoko Taru simply did not give a single ounce of a fuck and he just went all out and he's like, oh man, I see all of these pictures of the, the, the sexiness of my character. If you could all just like get those together into one big file that I could share online. <laughs> As, as the, the, the mainstream media is like losing their minds, like, Ugh, this, this whole this 2B is too sexy, Can, can't have this. It's like, man, if only somebody could collect all of these sexy pictures of 2B so that I could see all of them in one spot. <laughs> Wait till they find out about anime. Yeah. There's a real nice exposition on Jason's article in Power Up. Follow-up called Jason Schreier of Kotaku, Dragon's Crown, and Hypocrisy. Yeah, dude. Those were the days. Protect the sexy women in video games. Here's the thing. I think there's room for both. You can have sexy women in video games, and you can have women in video games that are not sexy. They're, it's perfectly fine. This is why, like I said, to me, the way that the protagonists look in Star Wars Outlaws doesn't bother me. If those were the only characters we were getting, that would be something. But we still have Eve and Stellar Blade, so that's fine. Perfectly fine. Why are they advocating discrimination against sexy women? It's, it's more so the whole thing about, oh, you just want to jack off to these characters. And I don't... It's like, bro, we have, we've had online porn for decades now. <laughs> I don't think people are looking to jerk off in video games. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> did you see what they did to the girl in the Fallout TV show? That post on Twitter about her ass. I saw something about that. I was like, okay, that's whatever. Again, I'm, I'm neutral on that because I don't care that somebody went to the trouble of doing that. At the same time, I also feel like... If I was the model for that picture, I could see how that would potentially affect, like, my, uh, it, it could make me maybe feel a little bit insecure. I mean, not me, because I'm 42 and I don't give a fuck if people think that I'm fat or I'm out of shape or whatever. I work out mostly for health reasons and maintenance, but, like, it wouldn't bother me, but I can imagine if I was potentially the model of that shot, <clears throat> At that age, maybe it would be some, something that would bother me. But fundamentally, it's like, I don't care. It's, it's online nonsensory. Who gives a shit? But people also get super upset about that.
Oh God, Templars, that's a rabbit hole I don't want to dive deep into. <clears throat> but anyway, we have another one here. No, not this one. This one. So apparently Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is underperforming, says an industry analyst. It is selling about a half of what Remake sold in the same time frame. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has reportedly sold about half of its sales of its predecessor Remake in the same time frame. That's according to industry analyst Daniel Hamad, who confirmed earlier the day that the highly anticipated RPG is underperforming sales-wise. Not to be that guy, but Rebirth is underperforming sales-wise, uh, Hamad, who is director of research and insights at Nico Partners, said on Twitter slash X. When asked to justify a statement, Amon added it's selling about half of what Remake sold in the same time frame. It looks like it'll have a weaker tail prior to any PS Plus-like release. When then pressed for a source, Amat confirmed that the sales data comes from Equity's research reports who are getting the data from the usual trackers. <clears throat> as some fans have pointed out, the two releases aren't strictly comparable as Remake was released when most of the world was in lockdown at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Remake's release in April 2020 also predates the current cost of living crisis at the end of the PS4's lifespan, whereas Rebirth is currently only playable in PS5. It's also possible that Re the remake of one of gaming's most seminal titles likely attracted a lot of players initially, but some may have not enjoyed it as much as the original and therefore chose not to pick up Rebirth. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was released on the 29th of February to critical acclaim. Ed described it as an overstuffed but lovable reimagining of the original game in his Final Fantasy VII Rebirth review. Uh, then there was a patch and a bunch of other stuff that they talk about here. But fundamentally, <clears throat> it seems like this is not selling as well as the remake. Now, here's my take on this. Number one, one of the main reasons why Final Fantasy Remake, Final Fantasy VII Remake sold as much as it did is because people still don't understand this very simple fact that there's a lot of people out there that play video games and buy video games and don't consume video game media. I like to call them the silent majority. This also happens on YouTube, by the way. I get a lot more views than people that actually interact with the video in any meaningful way. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm perfectly happy with people just watching silently, enjoying the content, moving on. I think that's perfectly fine. <clears throat> but particularly in gaming, we have tons of that we have millions of people that simply don't watch gaming content they don't care they just want to buy the video game and so when final fantasy 7 remake came out they go into their local GameStop or whatever store they happen to go to mom and pop store maybe even just go online They're like oh man I, I remember really enjoying final fantasy 7 back in the day because it was one of the most successful Final Fantasies ever, if it was a lot of people's first Final Fantasy, it was one of the most successful, if not the most successful video game on the original PlayStation, it's not surprising. So there's a lot of fans out there, and especially there's a lot of fans that don't consume gaming media. So they see the game, and it's called Final Fantasy VII Remake. In a lot of ways, I actually think that this was intentional by Square Enix. They're like, oh yeah, we're gonna call it a remake, even though technically speaking, we all know it's, it's not really a remake, it's a reboot. Let's let's be real. I mean, it's it's not even a reboot at this point. It's more like a sequel. It's, it's actually more of a sequel than necessarily a remake. But they thought, oh man, it's, it's like the modern version of my Final Fantasy VII game. And then they bought it and they played it and they were like, <clears throat> this is not a remake of Final Fantasy VII, and this is not even complete. It ends at the end of the Midgar section. What the hell is going on? And so when Rebirth came out, they're like, well, I'm not interested anymore. I'm done. It's whatever. And unfortunately, you know, Rebirth happens to be, from what I can tell, a really good game. I've played a little bit of it. I haven't gotten around to playing too much of it because, again, there's too many good things coming out at the same time. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, this game came out at the exact same time that I had to go and visit Capcom over in UK to get started on my uh, pre-coverage of Dragon's Dogma 2. So this is one of the reasons why I simply didn't have uh, time to play through Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I hope to get to it later at some point this year. But 
Yeah, from what I've played of Rebirth, I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed it more than what I played of Remake. I thought it was much more, uh, it was much more complete, much more of a complete experience. Like I think I even mentioned in my thoughts video that like this is the game they wanted to make all along. And fundamentally, it just kind of sucks because the silent majority they bought the remake and they just didn't follow through with then picking this one up. Now there's other factors involved in this as well. One of the things is usually just depending on the video game, sometimes sequels just aren't as successful, even like expansions, which this could almost be considered an expansion to the remake. And if you think about it, like Monster World sold, I don't know, 20 something million copies, probably coming close to 30 or something at this point. But Iceborne sold about half of that. And it's the same thing with Monster Hunter Rise and Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. So, you know, expansion stuff usually, you know, a lot of people play the base game, but they don't necessarily play the expansion. Even though this is its own game, it's more like a sequel and all of that stuff. But I think that those are some of the things. But then there's also, on top of those things that I just mentioned, there's the fact that the remake came at the end of the PS4 life cycle, and PS4 had a much bigger install base than PlayStation 5 has right now. Whereas uh, Rebirth is just on PlayStation 5. And hopefully this will get... Uh, Square Enix to understand that maybe being a PlayStation exclusive was a massive shot in the foot because this is another thing that a lot of publishers really, really underestimate. And that is the power of a massive release. Like the one of the best examples is Monster Hunter World, right? Even though Monster Hunter World was also limited to consoles at the time, but which just means that Monster Hunter World launch could have even been more explosive if it was also available on PC. And I think that's going to be something that we're going to be seeing when Monster Hunter uh, Wilds releases next year. I think that's that might actually be really, really successful. Of course, depending on as well business practices and what Capcom is going to be doing with that game and whether or not they learn anything from the release of Dragon's Dogma 2, right? But fundamentally... If if you were to release Final Fantasy VII Rebirth on PlayStation 5, PC, and Xbox at the same time, the launch of this game would have been much more explosive, and they would have made way more money than whatever PlayStation paid them for exclusivity. I think this is undeniable. And the reasoning is, there's so much power to word of mouth but word of mouth simply doesn't happen if the game doesn't launch on a certain community's platform. Like, you're not going to get the Steam community to be excited about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth if you're not releasing it there, even if you're going to end up releasing it there a year later. Nobody wants to be second choice, which is kind of like how it ends up feeling when you release an exclusive and then like two years later down the line, you're like, oh, I'm going to now release this on this other platform. It's like most people, sure, there will be a couple million people that will pick it up 100%. But it's like a lot of people don't actually like that type of treatment. This is one of the reasons why Monster Hunter was not as successful in the West is because the game would release in Japan and then a year later it would release in the West, right? So, you know, th th this is one of those things that I feel like they really need to take those into account. Uh, and then there's also, yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic, more people wanted to go buy video games that also had something to do with it. But I think that you could have easily offset all of that by just having a simultaneous release on all platforms. But, you know... It is what it is. I still think that the game's a ton of fun. I haven't finished it, so I can't really speak too much on it. But I think that the game is awesome from what I've played so far. So, <sighs> Japanese developers don't get it? Mm, I don't know.
Nintendo don't require multiple platforms? Well, Nintendo... Look, Nintendo is a special case, okay? Not everybody's Nintendo. <clears throat> Do you plan on streaming it? Streaming what? Rebirth? No, it's too late. It's too late for me to stream Rebirth. And when I did stream Rebirth, there's just not that level of interest in my live stream for it. I don't know why. Nintendo is its own monster, though, exactly. Final Fantasy franchise never sold well on Xbox because it, it because it's not there. <laughs> it's like it's like saying, man, Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate definitely did not sell very well on PC. Yeah, it wasn't there. <laughs> you could say the same thing other than Monster Hunter World. It's like, oh man, the Monster Hunter franchise doesn't really sell very very well on PC. Yeah, it's not there. <laughs> it's not surprising. Xbox just now got 14. And and friggin' whoever is responsible for marketing 14 and Xbox is a fucking lunatic. Can we just can we just say that? Well, not not marketing it, but whoever is responsible for the business model that they've implemented on Xbox for Final Fantasy 14 is a fucking lunatic. You're actually going to ask people to pay for two subscriptions? Fuck is wrong with you? Are you a moron? That's insane. It's absolutely insane. People have to pay for Game Pass and they have to pay for the 14 subscription. That's unreasonable. You, you need to either pay one or pay the other. You shouldn't have to pay both. That's absolutely, there's, there's still going to be a lot of people that end up paying both because most of the people on the Xbox ecosystem have Game Pass regardless. But still, that doesn't change the fact that you shouldn't be forced to pay both. I didn't play Helldivers 2 because of the PlayStation Online subscription. Yeah, but it's only one subscription. You don't have to pay it twice. <laughs> Why even have an Xbox in current year? Because of Game Pass, because... Not everybody wants to have a PC. If you have a gaming PC, then yes, you can have that argument. But not everybody wants to go and make a PC. And for those people, they might prefer the Xbox ecosystem to the PlayStation ecosystem. It's a Windows laptop with limited OS feature. Yes, but it's cheap. It's $500. And you're going to be hard-pressed to find a PC that is going to match the, the performance of an Xbox Series X for the same price. As a matter of fact, it's impossible. And again, I'm not even an Xbox user. I just think that you need to have a competitive environment in the market. PS5 is probably better, isn't it? It depends. Because, again, you guys are looking at this from the lens of people that have a PC and a PlayStation 5. If you have a PC and a PlayStation... I mean, hell, if you have a PC that can play video games, that has reasonable hardware, there's no reason for you to own an Xbox. But not everybody has that PC. And those people have to choose between the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox. And at that point, it becomes... Which titles do you like most? And that's it. And you choose, oh, I like these titles. Okay. I like Halo. Okay. Then you want an Xbox. You don't want a PlayStation 5. <clears throat> What's on PC that's not on PS4 or PS5? I could look up the list, but like an easy one would be Halo, Gears of War, that, I don't know, whatever other, because the thing is, I, I don't really consume that many of the Xbox uh, exclusives, so I don't have a lot of examples to give you off the top of my head, but instantly I can think, Forza, Halo, Gears. You can't play those on a PlayStation 5, so if somebody's really into Forza, Halo, and Gears, and they don't have a PC, they might want to consider the, the Xbox. So, you know, it's, 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 again, different, different strokes for different folks. All the Halo games are on PC. Ah, 
I got him. <laughs> sea of Thieves as well, yeah. PC, Switch, PS5 is the safe combo, though. Of course. I mean, if you can have those three, that's what I have. PC, PlayStation 5, and Switch. That's what I have. Hellblade isn't on PS4. Yeah, Hellblade's another one. Yep. Sea of Thieves is coming to PS5. Right. I wonder if it's going to have crossplay. Have they mentioned that? Excited for No Rest for the Wicked? You better believe it. I'm super pumped. Do you think it'll be good? Oh, yeah. People don't realize the microtransactions are optional and you don't need to buy them. Okay, that, that sounds like you're watching somewhere in the past at this point. <laughs> but Tom, to your point, microtransactions are optional and you don't need to buy them. Except they give developers the wrong incentive in a lot of situations. That's one of the things that people usually don't follow that up with. Like, they're optional and you don't gotta buy them. But they do provide with the wrong incentive, don't they? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Hellblade Glavinus. <laughs> All right. We have another one. We got another one here. This is from your boy, Mike Yabara. Now, Mike Yabara used to be the president of Blizzard. As a matter of fact, he said, you'll have to drag me out of Blizzard a couple of weeks before he quit. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Mike Ibarra has this really terrible take, which I feel is a little bit common for Mike Ibarra. But he said, I thought about this idea for a while as a player since I've been diving into single player games lately. When I beat a game, there are some that just leave me in awe of how amazing the experience was. At the end of the game, I've often thought, I wish I could give these folks another 10 or 20 bucks because it was worth more than my initial $70, and they didn't try to nickel and dime me every second. Games like Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, Red Dead Redemption 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Elden Ring, etc. Which, by the way, I believe all of these are $60 games. Not 70 I know that $70 is already a lot, but it's an option at the end of the game I wish I had at times. Some games are that special. I know most will dislike this idea. By the way, I realize we're tired of tipping and everything else, but I view this different from a pressure to tip type scenario many face and give feedback on. So this is a terrible idea. And let me tell you the main reason why this is a terrible idea. If you were to give me the option to tip at the end of a game, like when you're rolling the credits and it's like, hey, would you like to give us some more money? ba da ba da ba it, would, it could actually be something interesting if that money went towards the developers, towards the people that are actually working on the video game. And let me tell you something. Being the president of Blizzard, Mikey Barra knows all about that. You know that this money is not going to go to the animators that made the animations amazing, to the story writers that made the story really good, to the graphics artists that make the graphics look really good, the, the sound engineers that make the game sound fantastic, the combat designers that make the combat be good, the systems implementers that make good systems for a video game. You know damn well that's not where this money's going to go. Not to mention that you do this and you start incentivizing the same practices that we have right now in the hospitality industry where fundamentally you know waitresses and serves serving staff uh don't get paid as much because people are just like well you're gonna get tipped anyway so we're just gonna pay you shit and we're gonna force you to earn the rest of your salary by begging to the people that are coming over to our restaurant or our hotel or something to give you a measly pittance so that you can fucking survive right so it'll incentivize those types of behaviors. But on top of it, the developers themselves are never going to see any of this money. They're not. So this is just a terrible idea all around. There's nothing to be gained from this. And you know, 
you know, because the second you give publishers an inch, they're going to take a country mile and they're just going to find a way to nickel and dime people even more around this fucking tipping culture. So no, absolutely not. Better never see it. And it's no. And as a matter of fact, just a reminder, pay your developers more and stop fucking firing them while you're at it. How about that? How about people just stop firing developers instead of focusing on giving them tips? How about just pay them a good living wage? But yeah, it's this is just like Mikey Barra being on his shit. Especially the 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 thing that frustrates you the most is like you know that he was an executive at a company and that he knows for a fact that none of the developers will ever see any of this money. You just want to give more money to investors, Mike? You think they don't make enough already? Keep sacrificing people in the altar of line go up? Get the fuck out of here. Tipping in video games. What the fuck, dude? What the actual fuck? Absolute insanity. If this tipping system happened, it would end with games saying leave $20 tip to play against the real. Yeah, just they would sell you the, the actual real ending. Hey, you fit. we noticed you finished the game. Did you like it enough that you want to see the real ending? You know that scumbag developers would absolutely do that shit. Well, not the developers, the, the marketing folks and whatnot. Those types. Oh, man. <sighs> kind of sad, kind of sad. Go back to tokens to replay games. Yeah. Insert 50 cents. Hell, with today's inflation, we just insert, insert a full-on dollar. Because tipping culture works so well for waiters, might as well implement it for the devs. Yeah, true. Big true. Don't worry, the inevitable entropy of the universe will put an end to all of this one day. <laughs> like with a meteor. <laughs> How lucky are we that a meteor still hasn't hit the Earth like one of those planet killers? I mean, actually it has hit, except we weren't around back then. Our great-great ancestors, the dinosaurs, they were around. They got roasted pretty well. <laughs> Lucky? Yeah, Lucky Wada. Come on, man. Come on, man. Well, you jinked us. <laughs> yes, because I've mentioned, man, we're so lucky. I would look to the sky right now. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> that looks like dollar mood. What's happening? <laughs> What's going on? Still our chance. Yeah, dude. Okay, so, turns out, Baldur's Gate 3 becomes the first game to win every major Game of the Year award. Larian's RPG completes a feat that not even Elden Ring could. I am so, so happy for this. This article sparks joy, okay? And I would just like to point out one thing that I always like to point out. Uh, this is just basically me pouring salt on the wound that all game publishers uh, try to put out there when they're like, oh, is a, can we have a pittance? It, it, game development is so hard. We need to charge you all of these additional things. We need 50 different deluxe editions and all of these things just to be able to make this game. We need to sell you 
all of these microtransactions because otherwise it's simply impossible for us to make money. There's, there's just no conceivable way that we'll ever be able to just put out a video game like in the old days and that video game actually be successful and earn us enough revenue for us to live off of. Won't you think of the poor investors? Oh no, the investors! Oh, the humanity of it all! How are they going to buy their fifth yacht? And then along comes Larian Studios, and they're like, hey, are there any in-game purchases? No! There's no in-game purchases in our game. We believe in providing a complete and immersive gaming experience without the need for additional purchases. Enjoy the game to its fullest without any additional costs or microtransactions. Isn't that just a little something, huh? Turns out it is very much a viable business model that not only works, but it also gets this game to win every major Game of the Year award, which means the game is good. And, uh, yeah. It seems like it actually does work, huh? That's, that's, that's impressive. It seems like Baldur's Gate 3 can't stop winning Game of the Year awards. You aren't wrong. Just this week, Laren's ambitious 2023 Dungeons & Dragons RPG took home yet another prize during the video game purchase, uh, portion of the British Academy Film Awards, the BAFTAs. While it is impressive alone to take home a single Game of the Year award, the latest win marks a mo momentous first. Baldur's Gate 3 has taken home all five major Game of the Year awards given out by the industry. The winning streak started in November 2023 when Baldur's Gate 3 won Ultimate Game of the Year at the Golden Joystick Awards. The game then won the grand prize at the Game Awards ceremony in December, the Dice Awards in February, and the Game Developer Choice Awards in March. Baldur's Gate 3 wins at the BAFTAs, wraps up an astounding award season in which the game was pitted against titles like Alan Wake 2, Tears of the Kingdom, Marvel Spider-Man 2, and more. It's like the triple crown of video games, but with two more prizes. The quintuple crown, it's a pentakill! Pentakill! That's what Baldur's Gate 3 did right there. Just pulled off a penta! They got the penta. Straight up. Straight up. Congratulations, Larian Studios, on all of these awards. They most definitely deserve them. Baldur's Gate 3 is an amazing video game. Absolutely phenomenal. And it is going to go down as an all-timer. 100%. There's no doubt in my mind. But yeah. Eventually, I want to replay it and do a Dark Urge playthrough too. Again, we just need, I just need like, like, bro, can the gaming industry just chill out? For like two months so that i can replay baldur's gate 3 that's all i need just chill out for two months let me replay baldur's gate 3 all right the troop quadruple a game true dude big true big friggin true big friggin true So, next up, we just got the uh, announcement of the DLC for Remnant 2, which I already talked about earlier in the show. That is going to be coming out on the 23rd of April. It comes with a trailer. Let's take a look at it. The hell? I have searched this jungle high and low. And what did I find? I'd learned of the lost tribe's fate and the ancient power that sealed it. The living stones. Such power. I will find you, my lost tribe. My brethren. I am so close to the truth. What the hell is that? I will not give up. Bro. 
There's gonna be some good times, baby. There's gonna be some good times. Hells yeah. Time to play Remnant 2 again. It, it, isn't that just the thing with Remnant 2? Like, anybody who's played Remnant 2, like, you watch the gameplay footage here and you're like, oh man, I should, uh, should jump back in. I need to just jump back in. See, earlier you guys were asking me, well, one of you guys asked, uh, how do I deal with video game burnout? I don't get burnout. I could play this game right now. I just don't have time. There's, there's not enough time to play all the things that I actually want to play. I don't get burnout. Burnout's on content creation. <laughs> First DLC was great. Yep. 100%. I think I bought like the, the season pass or whatever. Because I bought the, the, the version. They did do one thing that I don't like, which I, I mentioned. I don't like this practice, which they did the whole three days early access thing or five days early access however much it was don't like that but i did end up buying the version that came with the early access time and that also came with all the dlcs so i'm already sorted for that but yeah we all need more time yep yep and it screwed me. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> Wada, Wada also bought like the Super Deluxe version so that we could play together and we couldn't, which kind of sucks. But at least there's a DLC already bought. Yep. We're going to be playing this Wada, right? We're going to be playing this day one. It's going to be fun times. Yeah, this game has a ton of secrets. Tons of good stuff. But yeah, so... There's another game that I wanted to check out real quick. Uh, this one is just kind of like an afterthought. I was thinking about potentially playing this game, <clears throat> Flintlock Siege of Dawn, and they have like a new gameplay commentary. So I figured we'd watch that. Check it out. <laughs> I'm Simon Dasan, Creative Director at A44 Games. And I'm Dale Pugh, Associate Art Director. We're an indie studio based in New Zealand. Our previous game, Ashen, was released in 2018. And we're oh, these are the guys who made Ashen? Overview for our Ashen was pretty good. Flintlock, the Siege of Dawn. I don't know if you guys remember Ashen. I only played a little bit of it, but it was pretty good. I didn't know that these were the Flintlock devs working is set on this. in the world of Kian, ten years after the door to the Great Below was opened, unleashing the gods and their armies of the dead. The lands of Kian are overrun. The coalition army is tied up in an increasingly hopeless siege outside the city walls. There is no one to defend the small towns and villages against the roaming hordes of the dead. You play as Nor Vanek, a Flintlock weapons expert in the coalition army, along with Enki a mysterious fox-like companion who enhances your combat skills with his magical abilities. On your journey, you will combine gunpowder, magic, and steel to build your character into a fabled god killer. You'll also meet and recruit your former coalition team to devise a plan to break the siege and end the war once and for all. As you travel throughout the world, you can establish your caravan at key rest locations. This is your chance to rest and prepare for your next adventure. The caravan will grow as you meet and recruit former coalition team members to your cause. Each team member is an expert in their chosen field and unlocks crafting abilities and additional quest content. It's always good to rest at the campfire and see what's new. Building on our it's Can I just say that I hate the this concept here? And recruit former I'll show you guys. Each team member is an expert in their chosen field and unlocks crafting abilities and additional. This. Fucking hate this. Like, Destiny started this trend of having like a virtual cursor on screen. Can't fucking stand it, dude. I hate it. What ha whatever happened to fucking D pad, dude? What happened to D pad? Can I just have D pad? Like, just give me D pad. It'd be so much easier to navigate this interface with a D-pad that it's not even funny. And it's like, hey, guess what? I press up on D-pad, it goes here. I press down on D-pad, goes here. I press right on D-pad, goes here. Isn't that amazing? 
Like, no, the analog stick. Oh, it's so much better with the analog. No, it's not. It's fucking terrible. The analog stick is not a fucking point and click mouse. God, I can't stand it. Anyway, that's the size of the coin. It's always good to rest at the campfire and see what's new. Building on our experience with Ashen, Flintlock retains elements of the Souls genre and infuses it with rapid mobility, resulting in dynamic and explosive combat, a style we call Souls Light. Flintlock's combat seamlessly interweaves melee and Flintlock weapons with magic and rhythmic battles where combos change. These animations are rough. These animations are rough. Chain together. Each enemy's attack pattern needs to be learned and mastered. Extreme mobility is a big part of the gameplay. It allows fluid and fast-paced action using your explosive black powder jump and dodge abilities. There are three main categories of weapon. Melee weapons, such as Nor's axe, flintlock pistols, I like the pistol. Black powder weapons, including I like the rifles, pistol gameplay. And grenades. The axe, for example, is no woodcutter's tool. This brutally effective weapon, along with an array of other single-handed weapons, provide players with unique combat opportunities. Each weapon has a different modifier to enhance and change the gameplay. Flintlock weapons are the primary tool in your arsenal to fight the dead. I'm also not vibing with the art style. It's like I like the concept of the gameplay, but the animations in the art style are turning me off. You restore black powder charges by hitting enemies with melee attacks. Secondary weapons are powerful flintlock firearms that require time and skill to reload. Like traditional black powder weapons of the past, they often only fire a single shot before needing to be reloaded with a skill-based reloading mechanic. <laughs> they got the Your sniper. Secondary weapon charges are only replenished while resting, so preparing in advance and knowing when to deploy them is key to their successful use in combat. Grenades give you new strategic options to deal with enemies. Each type of grenade has a limited number of uses. You can find more grenades by exploring the world. Much like the secondary weapons, you can restore your grenades by resting. The more grenades you pick up, the more you can throw between rests. Enemies can be engaged in a number of ways. Learning each enemy's moveset and mastering the best attack, counter-attack, and defensive moves are key to unlocking the full combat system in Flintlock. A break attack is an attack that cannot be blocked or parried. It will also leave you vulnerable to follow-up attack. You can interrupt an enemy break attack with your Flintlock arsenal, leaving the enemy open to a swift follow-up attack. With the right timing, a regular attack can be parried, opening the enemy up to counter-attacks and extra damage. The purple bar above the enemy is a priming indicator. Once an enemy is fully primed, you can perform a critical attack, which instantly defeats an unarmed enemy. Or strips the armor from a more heavily protected one. Oh, you actually see the armor coming off. The curse of death on enemies, allowing you to build up their prime from a distance before closing in to finish the job. While Inky's curse is active, your melee strikes will also build the priming bar, as well as inflicting damage. In addition to the curse of death, you can equip different curse stones to Inky. Are they using the Unreal Engine 5? No, they're using Unity. Because, like, there's some struggles with the rendering there. I've noticed some of the textures aren't loading in properly. And there's always a problem with a video game when, in their promotional material, the textures aren't loading properly. That's an issue. Each stone makes a strike apply a different status effect, such as poison or weakness. As you increase your bond with Enki, you will unlock powerful magical abilities called Witherings, 
Inky's withering gauge will build over time. When it's full, Nora and Inky can fuse together. I mean, just look at this. Like, actually. Look at this walking animation. What the fuck? Like, even just the walking animation, dude. Even just the walking animation. It bothers me. I'm, we I'm weird with animation, though. I'm weird. Build over time. When it's full, Nora and Inky can fuse together and unleash a devastating ultimate attack. Armored enemies take reduced damage and are less likely to be stunned by your melee attacks. While you can kill an enemy that's armored, you'll often need to remove it first by fully priming them and using a critical attack. Shields prevent all damage from a frontal attack. You must first remove the shield to attack head on or find other openings. Ripping off a shield exposes the enemy to a direct attack. With a war that has she can have a hammer? So long in Kian, oh coins man. And gold have become worth less than your reputation. Reputation is the currency in the world of Flintlock and represents your renown and experience. It can be spent to obtain skills and items. You spend your reputation? To your weapons and armor. How does that make sense? How does me upgrading my gear reduce my reputation? That's a weird... <laughs> that's a weird currency. Engaging in combat and defeating enemies is one of the best ways to build your reputation. The combat reputation multiplier rewards you for using unique moves in combat. Each unique strike, jump, or dodge you weave in builds your multiplier and increases the amount of reputation you gain. But be careful. If you take damage, you will lose your multiplier and the additional reputation that has been gained. You can choose to bank your reputation at any point and the multiplier will be reset to zero. Hamlets and settlements around the world that have become overrun with the dead. Defeating the boss will free the hamlet. The people will return to their normal lives and you'll gain access to the local coffee shop. Every coffee shop has a host. Hosts are mysterious creatures who care for the local inhabitants. A host will give you an extra health restoration flask as a reward for getting rid of the dead. You'll also gain access to the shop where you can cash in your reputation to buy clothing items and customize your look. Since the coffee shop is the central hub of every hamlet, hosts know everything going on in the local area and will offer up rumors which form the basis of Flintlock's side quests. If you choose to follow up on a rumor or engage in conversation with a local character you've met in the world, you'll be rewarded with quests. And what's in it for me? These are an excellent way to fully explore an area, unlock unique inventory items, and enhance your experience of the story. Even if you're not on a dedicated quest, it's always worth exploring off the main path as there are often more challenging enemies and greater rewards to be had. I like the premise of it. From myself, Dale, and the rest of the A44 team, thank you for checking out our gameplay summary. We hope you're looking forward to diving in and exploring the world of Flintlock. Oh, it's just 2024? It doesn't have a release date yet? Yeah, it's just 2024. No release date. Okay. How are you guys feeling on this one? Looks too ambitious for their budget? Yeah. 
It's like the animations feel very, very rough. The anime and the thing about me is always animations are the most important thing because without proper animations, combat feels too floaty. Because I really like the idea of the combat of you like, oh, you have this gun that you fire off and you have a, so it's kind of like a ranged melee hybrid. You have all these grenades that you can throw and all of that. Like that sounds amazing. It sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. I like the fact that she also has this hammer so that the thing doesn't have to be an ax. It can be a hammer as well. Uh, damn, what's going on with YouTube? Jesus. This is YouTube messing up. It's not the, the game, but. But I also am not the biggest fan of the art style. I feel like the art style is a little bit rough. So I don't know. There's a lot of things that kind of like peck away at me. C plus. Yeah, it looks unique, but not really my style. Kind of feels like those old German open world RPGs. You mean like Risen? Potential is there, but may not be realized. Yeah. Why Axe and Hammer? I hate the short range of Axe and Hammer. I love Axe and Hammer. That's actually one of the things that I like about this game is the, oh, let's have a sword. Everybody has swords. Having Axe and Hammer actually makes it unique. I like that. But yeah, I'm interested, but also hesitant, if that makes sense. But anyway, that is going to be it for today's episode of Con Zanvil. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, this is uh, still a work in progress. Uh, I put a different thumbnail this time around. I did commission uh, a specific drawing that I've been wanting to, to commission to have something a little bit more proper. For now, you get my ugly mug on there. Uh, but yeah, thank you all very much for hanging out. And uh, remember... This is going to automatically redirect you guys to the other live stream that I'm going to have soon. Uh, well, I say soon. It's going to be in about two hours. In about two hours, the... The Conscast episode with uh, Enshrouded's creative director goes live. And I really appreciate it that even if it's not a topic that maybe you're not super interested in, just hop by, listen to a little bit of it maybe, and hit the like button. It would really help me out. Thank you for doing that because I, in order for me to be able to get more opportunities to speak with more people in the industry, it is very important to have like a solid basis to pull from. So the more successful that one is, the better chance we have of future opportunities to be able to talk with creative directors, gameplay designers, that type of stuff. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. There was plenty of good stuff this time around that Captain James... But anyways, that's going to be it, guys. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong. Stay safe. Peace out.